Okay, well, welcome to you both. Uh, Matt Hayward from the Freedom Foundation and Rob Kaufman, Lincoln County Commissioner. I, uh, I wanted to have a conversation today to, to follow up on the um, kind of it's old, it's kind of old news that's now new news that Lincoln County passed the resolution to conduct bargaining with public employee unions in public and and what happened with that. If you could both give me a little bit of the history and then how it turned out. Um, Rob, I think you, why don't you start with, uh, I believe you saw, you saw some information that the Freedom Foundation had put out about a possible resolution and you followed up on that. How, how did that, uh, how'd that work out? Yeah, I don't know how far you want to go back on this, but that's that's kind of where this whole thing started. The timing is kind of interesting. We did get some information from the Freedom Foundation about um, conducting um, our bargaining sessions in an open public meeting, and I did a lot of research on it. And it sounded like a great idea. And at the same time, we were contemplating going out to the voters to increase our public safety sales tax by three-tenths of, of a percent because we really were struggling with trying to come up with enough funds to, to provide for public safety with our sheriff's office. So we thought if we, if we showed the public that we were sincere about our bargaining efforts and our, and, and our, um, our need for, the, for extra sales tax revenue, that if we conducted those bargaining negotiations in an open public meeting, it would just, uh, show the voters that we were, uh, we were, uh, we wanted to be transparent in everything we were doing. Well, so, and that, that's a, that's a good place to start because as one of your, as a constituent in Lincoln County, I, I know that um, our, our voters are very frugal and uh, yeah. tax avoidant. And so you did need to take some steps to be able to address that, to be able to raise more funds. Right, and I think it worked. I mean, we put we put together a pretty good um, uh, package. What we thought to explain the need to the voters and show them, hey, here's here's the situation. You know, we're limited to the property tax of of one percent per year, which we go backwards every year because the cost of doing business goes up three to five percent, where we're only collecting one percent more in in property tax. So then we rely on sales tax revenue which is not consistent. So, but I think we did a pretty good job of explaining it to the voters. And I think it passed, it was around 60 some percent when it passed. So, and, and that's saying something for Lincoln County, because like you say, we don't just, we're pretty, we're pretty stingy here. We don't like new taxes. And right. but we also, I think our people see the need and understand that plight of small government Right. I, I think that that one percent limit is uh, I mean, it works. It works better in a county that is undergoing a rapid growth rate, whereas for, for counties that are at a stay more stable rate, it's a, it's a problem. So that was I, I appreciate you bringing that that kind of background context for why this why Lincoln County brought it up. And then the union objected. And Matt, that's where you came in in helping with some of the what seems to be inevitable these days, uh, going around the court system every time some decision is made that changes things. So, how did that uh, how that play out for you as you because uh, this, this is something that your group has wanted to push for a while, and uh, so here's your test case. How'd that test case play out? Yeah. So let me give you a little bit of history leading up to that. So we had been helping citizens around the state with uh, initiatives at the local level, trying to. Do, the, do it by initiative to force the meetings to be open. And we had worked in uh, Mason County, Blaine, uh, Chelan, and Squim, and collected uh, the citizens collected enough signatures to get it on the ballot. Uh, long story short, it got stuck in court and was never voted on. Um, and so that, that process did not end up working out well. There was two initiatives, though. One was the transparency with collective bargaining, and the other was actually right to work. Uh, the right to work one was much more controversial and a much larger focus for the unions. Uh, this is kind of important because subsequently we switched gears and decided to go directly to elected officials and plea with them to support the idea of transparency uh, and to point out that the citizens wanted the transparency. The unions were already 
geared up and ready to battle because of the initiatives that had happened back in 2012, 2013. Uh, so what ended up happening is they would go around the state wherever we were going and talking to people and tell them this was illegal and that they couldn't do it and that they would sue them. Uh, this happened in Grays Harbor County, Clark County, um, anybody who was entertaining the idea. So when we got contacted, uh, when Chairman Kaufman contacted me and I went over and met with them and spoke with them, it sounded like they really wanted to do this. Um, one of the things I advised them is that it was very likely the Teamsters would come at them and tell them to rescind the policy or they're going to sue them. And I think it was maybe maybe two weeks later. Uh, could have been a week later. I can't remember now, but it wasn't too long after I get a call from Rob saying, so you were right uh, that they came and they want us to rescind the policy and uh, admit we broke the law and apologize and uh and we don't want to. We want to keep the policy, but we also are a small county who uh, we're fighting to increase our budget here. We don't really have the means to fight uh, a, a, you know, a national union. Uh, what can you guys do for us? And so that's when I went and talked to the legal team to find out what we could do. And uh, they started meeting with the, the county to, to figure out a strategy of how we could get in and uh, work with them to defend them in court. Okay. Um, you know, and I do want to talk to Joe Kuhn a little bit later and find out the answer to this question, but what, what was the most uncomfortable part of this bargaining? I mean, it's, um, the, the unions uh, would, would probably say that they didn't want to make some proposals in public, but of course you're making proposals as well. So what was the most, the most uncomfortable part of this for you, Rob? Uh, well, I don't, I think the most uncomfortable part was when we started uh, we went down the road. We said we were going to negotiate in, in public meeting and invited the union to come negotiate with us. And they did come one time and we negotiated in an open public meeting and it went pretty good. And, and we didn't finalize anything, but we made some progress and we scheduled another meeting. I don't know. I think it was a couple of weeks later. And, um, and the union showed up with their legal counsel and demanded that everybody in the room that wasn't directly involved with the uh, negotiating process leave the room. And we stood our ground and said, no, we've, we're gonna bargain. We're ready, willing, and able to bargain, but we're gonna do so pursuant to our transparency resolution. And, so, and I'm not a lawyer, so, but I had one sitting right across the room from me arguing with me. And, and this went back and forth uh, for quite a while. And, Eventually, um, the union got up and left the room, and they went into a back room for a while and then remained back there for 10 minutes or so, and then eventually left the building and never came back to the negotiating table. So that, that, that was pretty uncomfortable being, um, you know, put in that position to, you know, basically, we stood our ground. But... But then I, I must say after that, I, you know, that then it started the whole legal battle after that. And at, I'll fast forward a little bit just for a minute, but after we started negotiating with them lately in this la latest round where we um, actually have two contracts now, um, those negotiations went great. Done in an open public meeting, there was no, um, ill feelings, no, I, I felt perfectly comfortable negotiating with those guys. And I thought it was a pleasant experience. And I think we reached an amicable uh, agreement on both sides, so. so. So once you got past the, once everyone got past the uncomfortableness of, of change, it worked out. Now, I, I was also wondering if it's an open public meeting. Uh, I mean, I could have gone up there to, uh, as a constituent, um, but I didn't because I had other things to do. So I'm just curious if any public showed up. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did have some public attend. Not a lot, but the uh, newspaper people were there and some other interested members of the public. I mean, we we hardly get anybody that comes to our county commissioner meetings. So <laughs> it's pretty boring around here. But nonetheless, it's, um, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was overall, it was a good experience getting to the final um, contract. Okay. 
Uh, Matt, have you had any other jurisdictions approach you about uh, with the for advice on how to to do this in their own their own settings? Yeah, we've had a great combination of people working with us, asking us for direction, and some that have simply copied it and just gone on their own. Uh, for example, Ferry County, um, I found out I think six months, nine months later after they had been negotiating in public. Uh, they just quietly passed the resolution and started doing it. Um, Pullman School District was similar, uh, although one of the school board members at the time was also a county commissioner that I had sent information to as well. Um, uh, the county of Spokane was the one we worked most closely with, who just recently uh, started negotiations with one holdout that they had had there, but they've, they've been successfully having contract negotiations uh, Kittitas County was another one that they passed an ordinance to uh, have their meetings done and open, which they did, and they subsequently passed a moratorium in lieu of the litigation in Lincoln County. They wanted to wait and see what would happen there, but they did pass an ordinance and they did negotiate in public, and, and you asked about people attending, and I, I kind of find that to be a, a funny point because, as Rob mentioned, most people don't attend regular meetings. Um, these type of meetings are like watching paint dry. Uh, I don't know why, you know, most people would never want to go. A lot of it is the principle of having it public if people want it to be public. Um, but I think the first meeting that they had originally was relatively decently attended, but it was by the bargaining unit primarily. A bunch of the people who were represented uh, showed up at the county commissioner's meeting and there wasn't an issue. And probably after that, the only reason why people showed up is because the union made such a big deal about it. Um, they're really the driving force in turning people out to these meetings, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, there's uh, probably 12 or 15 different local governments in Washington now that are doing their negotiations publicly. You bring up an interesting point about the members of the bargaining union uh, unit that the union is representing. Uh, of course, people who are represented by the county commissioners could show up, but about the bargaining unit, was that, were there some regular attendees uh, from that group, Rob, in any of the, the successful negotiations? From the bargaining unit? Yeah. Yeah, and any of the deputies show up? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, typically they have a team. You know, we have two Teamsters contracts, and so there's a couple couple of the uh, representatives from both of those attended the, the bargaining sessions. Did, did you hear anything like they, they appreciated it or they just didn't happen to say anything or? Uh, no, nobody really said anything. But again, it was the, the last session that we successfully negotiated these contracts and the last multiple sessions were, were great. It was a good, pleasant experience. That's, that's good. So, uh, so morale then seems to be doing fine, not not damaged by the by the whole process. You know, I I, I can't speak to the um, employees, but I will say, you know, they were they were like I think about five years without a contract, mm. and but during that time, um, we were still paying them, and and um, of course, but we were we were providing all the terms of the previous contract mm -hmm. um, that it had in there, including the colas. So, including the, what? Whole, the cost of living increases. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so both those bargaining units who went that long without a contract still received the benefits of those contracts, um, the, including the colas. So they're really, they, they really didn't, um, other than uh, not being able to negotiate uh, wage increases or different things, they they still got the same cost of living increases as the rest of the county did. So the system worked and the system has absorbed a small change and survived. <laughs> I think it survived quite well. And keep in mind too, that just because the, um, the Teamsters were, we were in a legal battle with the Teamsters, we were still negotiating in open public meetings with our other union contracts. In fact, mm -hmm. we've successfully negotiated two three-year contracts um, with each of those since this whole thing started and but we did not get the, the pushback from the other union so we have four total unions in lincoln county two teamsters and two at with what's called AFSME. so the uh, public works folks and then the courthouse employees are two separate unions 
And like I said, we negotiated a total of, this makes a total of six contracts since we've been doing this that have been negotiated in an open public meeting. Okay. And, and what triggered this conversation today was the, the, the announcement that you, you'd made of the most recent, the two with the Teamsters uh, representatives that had been concluded. Right. Um, right. So uh, Matt, are there others around the state that have concluded or they're all just getting ready to start? Oh, no, there's actually, uh, most of them, I believe, have concluded contracts. Some of them are in their second round of contracts. So even though Lincoln County was having this litigation, a number of different districts around the state um, decided to fearlessly move forward. They believed that they were in the right and that the Teamsters was just making a show. Um, and they also recognized that at that point, Teamsters was the only union refusing to negotiate. Several AFSCMEs local had, had already done it in different areas, including Lincoln County. Um, and so, and we've also seen the WEA has been doing it in a number of different school districts as well. So um, Soap Lake, Royal School District, I've got a list over here of, of a, a number of different ones that have moved forward and been doing this for um, some of them since 2018. Uh, so th they knew that, and that's one of the things we tried to talk to them about and let them know that the union's tactics from our experience, not just with this in general, is typically to stall. It's to get into the courts and just to grind it out as long as possible. And so we kept telling people, if you want to wait for the conclusion of this, it could be four, five, six, seven years. That's their goal is to make it last as long as possible. It's not going to be over next week. And so I think a number of them decided to just move forward. Well, as, as the attorney on this conversation, uh, is the litigation is done. Uh, this is going to keep going and it's not going to get relitigated. So for the record, I'm not an attorney. I'm the Oh, sorry. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, this is over. With Lincoln County, it's over. There is no pending litigation that I'm aware of uh, anywhere. There has been some unfair labor practices on various uh, specific details around the state. Pardon me. Um, sorry about that. Um, but it could be relitigated. It would just be about the, the specific scenarios. Uh, and, and it gets really, really interesting. So you cannot refuse to negotiate um, mandatory subjects of bargaining, and you cannot hold them hostage by refusing. Uh, uh, the day has started. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> uh, you can't refuse uh, to negotiate mandatory subjects over permissive subjects. And this is a permissive subject of bargaining. Uh, so that's where it gets tricky is neither side has to negotiate over it, um, but neither side can force the other to do what they want either. So you end up at this impasse of not negotiating. Um, and there is no, no one is in the wrong for not negotiating uh, unless someone refuses to negotiate. Um, and so it really gets down to a real technicality of if you say I won't negotiate because then you've committed an unfair labor practice. If both of you just keep saying, I'm ready to negotiate, I'm ready to negotiate, um, but you want something and you're just not saying it, and that's kind of what ends up happening. The courts didn't want to deal with it. It went all the way up and then back down again, and the courts refused to deal with it because they acknowledged that there is no fix. There is no legal remedy to this. It has to be done through the legislature if they want to figure out who, who can dictate whether these meetings are open or closed. Uh, which makes it very interesting. So we really don't have a conclusion other than the fact that we know it's legal. We know it can be done. It is being done. And as hard as the unions fought to stop it, they failed. So to us, that's a complete victory. The only, the only thing we're lacking is the court saying the elected body has the ability to require these meetings to be done in public. We don't have that. We have everything short of that. I, I've read the uh, the conclusions of law from from the last uh, I think from the last go round and that's kind of what I'm getting from that is that it's basically telling everybody to please please go up be an adult <laughs> and sit down and talk to each other and I'm sorry I accused you of being an attorney you're just the man who tracks the attorneys <laughs> got it yes I, I get I keep them busy okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you both joining me this morning early, and I, uh, I, I think this is some 
you know, it's kind of a good news that there's no news. Uh, and I look forward to sharing this with our listeners at Spokane Talks Media. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. Keep listening for the rest of the story. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have as my guest for this conversation, uh, Joe Kuhn from Spokane Teamsters Local at 690. Did I get that right? Yes, he did. Okay. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you today, Joe, about the recently concluded negotiations with Lincoln County. Um, you guys you guys got put in the uncomfortable position of being the the crash test <laughs> crash test dummies for the whole this change in process. And um, so I, I wanted to talk to you about how that experience has been, um, have come through it. And uh, so how did it first come up to you as, a, 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 as an issue? How did the first issue come to your attention? Um, back when we were initially starting negotiations, um, our contract was ending in 2016. So we did some preliminary stuff to open up to contract negotiations. And I had actually heard from a shop steward at the time that they intended to do or that they had passed this resolution that it was going to be done in the open public bargaining well that was the first time i had heard about it so i contacted them and they said yes we passed this resolution and we're not going to bargain unless we can do it in the public and of course that prompted uh, a response from us uh, opposing doing it in public and to stay status quo which um all of our locals um, at, at least in the state, uh, they operate in private. Um, it's not because it's some secret process, but because that's just the way it's been um, for years. Um, so we kind of bantered back and forth on that. ULP charges were filed and Fair Labor Practice charges were filed with PERC. Um, then it was withdrawn because there was a deficiency notice on it. So we had to correct that and refile on Fair Labor Practice charges. In turn, um, actually, I think they might have done it before we did it, but um, the Freedom Foundation on behalf of the Lincoln County filed their own ULP charges against us for refusing to bargain in public. So here we are at a stalemate, um, you know, both sides claiming that we should be able to keep it in our way. And um, <laughs> that's kind of how the whole thing started. And then it, did, of course, entered into the long legal battle with Public Employment Relations Commission, you know, so that's how it started. And, you know, and it kind of ended that way when I, when I read the court ruling. The court ruling was kind of like, it's a stalemate, and they didn't give you a definitive solution other than you guys should just go talk to each other. I, I actually call it a non-answer from the Public Employment Relations Commission because at the end of the day, it wasn't a win for either party. It really wasn't. I mean, no side prevailed on this and, you know, raised the flag, you know, the battle flag that we won, right? They came back and said, both of you committed unfair labor practice charges or committed unfair labor practices. You both have to post a notice in the workplace that you both violated this law. And then neither party can go uh, insist upon their, their side, whether it's public or private, now go negotiate in good faith. And I'm like, well, that doesn't say anything. So what happens if we don't agree now, right? Um, I will see with other employers on the private side, um, a lot of times when we have these discussions about where negotiations are gonna happen, many times we do it at a hotel. We'll go rent hotel conference rooms and we'll do that so that we're in a neutral space, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we beat that whole argument we just say let's just go over here and meet well we haven't had that option right because both of our sides are dug in um so yeah it was a little frustrating that perk at least didn't say some kind of an option here it was just go back and, and negotiate and honestly by that time um you know we've been without a contract for almost four years i think and uh, you know, the members are hanging out there without a contract. And I just said, you know what, let's get back to the table. I don't care if it's in public or not. We need to get a contra contract in place for our employees here. So. And, and to clarify, I think when there is no contract, just means that like the old contract sort of hangs in there until a new one comes in. So there, there is at least something. 
Yeah, and, and sorry, I'll, yeah, I'll clarify on that. Yeah, so the, the current contact or contract that was in place up to 2016 stays status quo. However, um, when you have a, an expired contract past the end of the year of expiration, um, it does stay status quo, but it doesn't have built-in raises. It doesn't have arbitration protection. So if they terminate an employee, we don't have the ability to arbitrate the case. So there are some pretty serious deficiencies if you don't have a contract. Um, but in, in this case, I, I do give props to the county. They continue to give their raises, the percentages that they'd been giving in the past. Um, so we didn't have to argue over back wages or anything like that, right? It was, you know, the county county on their part did the right thing. And that was that, that was good. So uh, and and Joe, I, I think as a, as an observer that I think the, the union did the right thing too. You guys came together and you did talk. So were there were there some things that you uh, discovered were different, uh, more comfortable than you thought they would be, or less comfortable with by doing it in public? What what was the difference in the end? You know, ultimately in the end, because nobody's showing up for the bargaining, uh, we had the one reporter from the Davenport paper. Um, other than that, they record it, or they have it live, I guess. Um, you know, if somebody wants to get on the internet and actually watch the proceedings. But, uh, you know, it really, it, it didn't necessarily change the dynamics of the bargaining. Um, but, you know, coming into it, I was fully prepared to just negotiate the contracts. I really put that aside at this point. You know, there's other legal battles going on right now with the city of Spokane and all of that over the same issue. And I think this is going to come up in legislation to get clarification on the Open Public Meetings Act. Hopefully they'll put it to bed once and for all that we won't have to talk about it. But, um, you know, in the meantime, uh, you know, I went in and, and met with them. Uh, it was actually very comfortable. There was no animosity. And we, you know, pretty much started out the meeting saying, hey, you know, that's the past. Let's just move on. And um, we were able to have great open discussion, honestly. So what advice would you give for, for other unions who are in, in this predicament? It's probably going to take a little while for any kind of legislative clarity to come. But in fact, for, for that matter, a, a second question would be, what would you advise the legislature and, and how's the best way to provide clarity that balances both sides? For other unions, um, <laughs> that's a good question because there, there are a little bit of differences in, in their approaches. Um, I would probably say, you know, take maybe take on the fight and, you know, to get that clarification. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the members end up potentially suffering from it. So, you know, maybe you take on the fight and you say, okay, we disagree with this, but let's go get this contract done. Let's not play around with our members' lives here. Um, you know, in hindsight, maybe I could have done that. Um, but it was pretty contentious, you know. I mean, it was both sides were bristled up and in fight mode. So it, it just went downhill from there. <laughs> that's, but that's common, right? I mean, that's what happens sometimes. And, um, yes, I've been party to negotiations where I've been prone to describe the two sides as the bull elk and mating season. And just there's a lot of this going on. But once you get past that, we can get things done. Um, so you, all, you guys all got past that. Um, how, um, I, I, I think you understand uh, where the commissioners were coming from and wanting to do public. It's they, and I mean, they've made their arguments and you've made yours. Given that both sides have a piece of the truth, what, what, what should legislators do to help provide clarity to both sides? You know, what I had asked for through our legislative folks at the Joint Council is to force the legislature to write an opinion on the intent of the law. Uh, because I think that without creating new legislation, they could actually go and say, this is what we intended with this law. We didn't in include or in, um, intend to include or exclude these particular reasons from public, right? I think that would be the easiest way to do it. Uh, we've looked at both approaches, whether we just need to change the Open Public Meetings Act or just have the clarification. I personally think the clarification would be enough. Um, I think that's just the easiest route to go, frankly. And then both sides could just go back to doing status quo. And like I said, there's nothing private about that. I mean, is there's nothing you know, really private about it necessarily. 
that's not secret. I get what the commissioners were saying about it, but um, they, everybody gets to see the final contract. It's not like it's a hidden document, right? right. At the end of the day, so. Negotiate, I've, yeah, negotiations are an interesting thing. I've been involved with those in construction. So that's, that's where my ex experience comes from. Gotcha. Um, but those haven't been open public meetings. Those have been uh, places where people could pound the table if they felt like it, but right. still. Um, well, I, I am really glad that you, you were able to come to agreement that the, the two parties were, and uh, it was great that you stepped up to do that. Uh, um, what was the final, any uh, final things about that particular contract that you're, you're really glad that you got resolved? Um, Having the, the provision for arbitration is super important. So I'm, I'm glad that we've got the signed contract now that there's at least that protection. Um, we did lock in, uh, again, the language that we've had for, I think, the last few contracts uh, related to wages. You know, the county did uh, make some improvements on the medical, uh, the medical cost. And for the deputies, we solved, or we think we've solved with our new contract language for deputies that um, there's not going to be gaps in coverage. We created some new um, on-call language to make sure that we had deputies available when, you know, during those times when there's no coverage. Um, so we, we made some good accomplish, accomplishments, I think, uh, that, that are going to benefit the county and the members, of course. So. Good. Well, I, I appreciate you working on the coverage issue because as a, as a resident of the county, I, that matters to me, too. <laughs> and, and truthfully, it, it, it matters to the deputies too, but you have to have some kind of a process in place, you know, that, that outlines exactly how that happens, you know, so that you're not just randomly trying to contact people and, you know, someone's not answering their phone and then someone threw, threw down the list does. And it was just, you know, and, and that's not the deputy's fault. It's just that, you know, it wasn't set up in a manner that, gave the best coverage and now I think we've conquered that I think we've at least got a really good start so that was I think that was a good accomplishment well that that's good for everyone I think that's a challenge that people that don't live in a rural county may not be aware of that we do have right. issues with maintaining coverage with a small number of deputies so you bet I uh, appreciate your hard work on that and I thank you for joining me today I'll join this with the the interview I did earlier with with uh, Rob Kaufman um, county commissioner and We'll have a little presentation for the county so they can know how this all turned out. Well, good. And, you know, in closing, I would say that I, I really did appreciate, um, you know, when they came to the table, it, there, were, there didn't seem to be any hard feelings or anything. You know, we all shook hands and said, hey, let's get this done. So it really did work well. There was no animosity across the table for either side. And I really appreciated that. I was hoping we weren't going to get into this, you know, as you refer to the bull elk kind of situation, but it, did, it didn't go there. So I was very pleased with their response on their side. So I'm glad with how it turned out as well. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention this morning and um, look forward to talking with you maybe the next time that you're out here for, uh, for negotiation. <laughs> I may be retired by then, but. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Have Thanks again, Joe. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.